Unfortunately, we start to lose muscle as we age. And if we want to preserve our insulin sensitivity, we need muscle. And if we want good blood sugar regulation, 80% of you know, your post meal glucose is going into muscle. So if you don't have muscle, it's a problem. And so I think yeah, I just want to encourage more and more people to start resistance training. And tonight we will talk about using um, serum creatinine as a proxy to look at overall muscle health. And I found over the years working with clients is low creatinine to be quite common in people who just don't exercise mm -hmm. or, or who are under muscled. And so there's just simple ways to sort of look at this. Now, before we continue on and dive into these details, I do want to thank you for being here. If you're enjoying the content, thanks for hitting that like button. Leave me a comment below and be sure to share this with a friend so that they can get these details. Also, if you regularly exercise or you want to start exercising, we have formulated a novel drink mix that contains both electrolytes and creatine. New research shows that when you co-ingest creatine with electrolytes, it helps support healthy hydration and athletic performance because the creatine transporter protein depends upon electrolytes. So if you're just doing creatine monohydrate supplementation alone, you might get more benefit when you co-ingest them with electrolytes, especially around exercise. Studies show that when you consume creatine around exercise, it increases the absorption by about 15%. And again, that transport protein to get creatine into your working muscles needs electrolytes to work. So you can save using the code podcast over at myoscience.com. Use the code podcast to save. I'll put links below. Welcome back to Peak Human. We're doing another live intro. We're here with Metabolic Mike. How's it going? Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Brian. Yeah, Mike's in Austin, so we're doing a little live event. Can you tell us what the event's going to be about? Yeah, so we're going to take a deeper dive into blood work analysis, looking more at patterns, trends to sort of ascertain if people have insulin resistance, metabolic dysregulation, and where to start with lifestyle exercise and uh, nutritional prescriptions. So that's kind of the, the idea is to look more at the health of the liver using liver function tests. And all these things are readily available through, you know, standard physicians or LabCorp now or directlabs.com. We're also going to talk about blood viscosity. I think it's really timely considering now the flu is back and, and post COVID and things like that. People, their blood viscosity has been shown to increase. And that is an underrecognized driver of cardiovascular disease that's even more sensitive and causative than say LDL cholesterol that everyone is so focused on. And then we're gonna talk about apolipoprotein B, which is on the exterior portion of LDL cholesterol and VLDL and so forth. And for whatever reason, when most people go to their doctor's office with an annual physical, ApoB is missing. And that really leads us to not make good clinical conclusions about what's going on cardiometabolically with those individuals. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about exercise and DHEA and also again liver health is a big focus mm. as well so you just told me we might not have a lot of time to get in the exercise part so we'll do a little bit up front right now yeah. and just to let people know if people heard that train crossing we're live we're here at the sapien center we got some people eating some charcuterie boards behind us and yeah we're doing a lot of events here this is going to be a really great one we've got about 55 60 people coming amazing so i want to let people know too if you're in town come buy and visit or if you're like Mike and you you know you're an influencer or a content creator let me know and come by and let's do an event it's an awesome center there's a gym in the back the sauna plunges that's great <laughs> we got it all we got uh, our members doing workouts right behind us right now that's cool but uh yeah so tell us more about the exercise stuff that you're not going to get into yeah in talk. well I think exercise as an intervention to improve metabolic health is again underappreciated. Just simply walking, especially in the post meal window, is so effective for decreasing glucose and also lipids in the post meal window. And if we think about, you know, heart disease is still the number one cause of mortality here in the US and all throughout the world. And so if we're serious about saving lives, then we need to prevent heart disease. And, and a simple way to do that is to become more metabolically flexible. And a lot of people have hitherto up to now improve their metabolic health with low carb diets. And that's been awesome. And there's also been fasting, but thankfully there's new research on resistance training specifically, not just cardio or walking, showing that it actually can support longevity, decrease cardiovascular disease. And so I, I think that we're at this sort of precipice of, of new awareness about that exercise should be a foundation. And I've just read so many comments over the years of posting low carb content where people said, hey, I, I lost weight eating bacon and ribeyes why do I need to exercise? And it's like, well, that's great that you lost the weight, like good for you, mm -hmm. but you, there's other things that you can and should be doing to support your muscle because uh, unfortunately we start to lose muscle as we age. And if we wanna preserve our insulin sensitivity, we need muscle. And if we want good blood sugar regulation, 80% of you know, your post meal glucose is going into muscle. So if you don't have muscle, 
it's a problem. And so I think yeah, I just want to encourage more and more people to start resistance training. And tonight we will talk about using um, serum creatinine as a proxy to look at overall muscle health. And I found over the years working with clients is low creatinine to be quite common in people who just don't exercise mm -hmm. or, or who are under muscled. And so there's just simple ways to sort of look at this now. And people really experience transformations when they start to get stronger, they feel better. Um, you know, they're just doing more things volitionally, you know, their recreational activity, gardening, going on hikes, doing trips that they never thought they could because they're more physically fit, which I think is just amazing. I think I've, I've seen the same thing where there's, there's this older middle-aged crowd that just is like, hey, I lost weight, I'm fine. But I went to Africa two years ago for the Food Lies film and I, you know, was spending time with hunter-gatherers and it, a little change went off in my head. It's like, in the U.S., it's like, it's good to exercise, right? It's like the notion of, it would be good if I exercise. I realize the human baseline is to exercise. It's required, like some sort of movement. Right. Like they're not going and hitting a gym. They're going on six hour hikes. And we did like an eight hour hunt with the Hadza. It's like, this is just normal business. Like the human body requires movement. That's so essential. Uh, and so if you think about the organ of muscle, if you think about, say, your pancreas, it depends upon stimulation from the brain and gut hormones to release insulin. The muscle depends upon movement to release these chemicals called myokines or exerkines, which go to your liver, to your fat cells, to your brain, improve cognition, memory, prevent dementia. And so if we're not moving our muscle, we're really um, causing dysfunctional signaling throughout the body. And like you said, life has become so complacent and easy. You, you don't, there's no need to leave your house anymore. You can or have Alexa or Siri do everything for you. And so that's why we need to bake in structured activities. And that's why we do need to do things like, you know, now if you live in the country, you're chopping wood. Um, I was watching this video on uh, people in Siberia, how they procure their water. They have to get all of the water during the month of September from the river and freeze it. And then every day chip away at it mm. just to get enough water to drink. And most people would not even have the bandwidth to do that. To take a shower, they're chopping wood for 45 minutes just to take a shower. And they only take a shower one day a week because it's so much mm -hmm. effort to do so. So um, if you're not doing those things in your life, you work on a computer, you work from home. It's great if you walk your dog, but then you should be doing push-ups, pull-ups, you know, Turkish get-ups, kettlebell swings, you know, glute bridges, things like that. Um, again, to pre preserve this muscle, but also to cause that signaling that is so helpful. Like I said, BDNF in the brain and, and the myokine release and all of that. It's great stuff. We're going to get more into it in the talk. One more thing before we start, we talked about carb cycling before and I was saying myself, I actually went low carb for many years and then I brought them back in. I just switched them instead of eating like refined grains and like bread, I just started eating like fruit and whole food carbs. So maybe you could talk a little more about that and even timing them, like when to eat them around the workout, stuff like that. Yeah, it's such a good point. I think, you know, it comes back to this binary thinking. Um, carbs are bad because they raise your glucose, so therefore I shouldn't have them. But actually, uh, when you're doing resistance training, like we were just talking about the importance of, you actually want to be burning glucose during that workout. And that actually helps your muscles in, improve strength and hypertrophy and recovery. So timing carbs around exercise um, doesn't negatively, you know, you know, predispose you to developing diabetes or all the metabolic complications because you're actually using those carbohydrates during the exercise session. So I think for a lot of years, many people became dogmatic because we were excited about ketones and all the metabolic properties that ketones offer, and that's really exciting and phenomenal. However, if we take a step back and look at this from a bigger picture and think about the whole body, particularly the muscle, it makes more sense to optimize the exercise session. And part of uh, one way to do that is to have either intra-workout carbs, some people, if you're heavily muscled or training intensely, pre-workout carbs, and for people who are just sort of newbies but have a good workout, maybe post-workout carbs. And what people will find is it doesn't disproportionately increase your blood glucose or cause a lot of deleterious changes, metabolically speaking. So mm -hmm. reframing, you know, again, I think the pendulum is always swinging. It swung a little bit too far in, in the opposite direction, that all carbs are bad and they must be mm -hmm. avoided and all that too. Well, what if we think about in context? Because if you look at various fitness models, you know, and um, natural athletes that are competing, some of these people have 300, 400 grams of carbs per day, and they're not metabolically sick, nor are they overweight or obese. So it has to do with the training intensity and the volume. So I think personalizing the carbs, instead of setting an arbitrary number, 
you only can have 20 grams, mm -hmm. 20 grams a day to be in ketosis or whatever. I say, well, on days that I'm training, I can have say 50, 60, 100. Days that I'm traveling, maybe it is 20. And, and think about when you're gonna consume those carbs, ideally around exercise. I love that. I love being more thoughtful about it. And uh, yeah, I'm glad more people are kind of waking up that there's a difference. Like there's a huge difference between a donut and a piece of fruit. Like it's just totally, it's wildly different. So watch it on YouTube. We're doing a live presentation and good stuff, Mike. Let's Thank do it. Thank you. I'm ready. Well, thanks for coming everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks Brian for the event. And we're going to have a lot of fun talking about labs and blood work. Okay. So this is an individual, again, a classic presentation for someone who's abusing testosterone which unfortunately is pretty common nowadays because it's so easy to get on the internet. You can buy testosterone, any steroid or SARM you want. And this individual is actually really concerned about his health because he's a client, but also a friend of mine. And so one thing we haven't really talked about here is the serum creatinine. Okay. So this is associated with kidney function and kidney health, but it's also a reflection of your lean muscle mass. And what I see in a lot of under muscled people, the creatinine is like 0.6, 0.55. Okay. Ideally, honestly, you want to get that closer to one. Now it doesn't mean that you take a bunch of creeds and you know, I just got to jack up my creatinine levels. No, it means you need to lift weights, but the creatinine is a reflection of your overall muscle mass. Okay. And as, as a part of that, you're releasing more creatine breakdown because you're using your muscle. You have more muscle. Creatine is stored in your muscle. I know most of you aren't scared of creatine, but is anyone like, mm, I've heard about creatine, man. It's bad for you. Anyone we need to do a quick creatine crash course. Most people are sold on it because you just ate some creatine, by the way. So just let you know if you're scared. <laughs> no, so it's creatine is naturally found in meat, but it can be an ergogenic aid. It's one of the, the legal, the best legal ergogenic aids, meaning it helps exercise performance when you use it. So I recommend, uh, I'm, and I'm biased, of course, because I sell an electrolyte with creatine, but pairing those have been studied by scientists to actually improve healthy hydration as well as actually one rep exercise performance. Anecdotally, a lot of people do enjoy that. So uh, really important for both hydration uh, and muscle health. So if we go to the next slide, really problematic here. You know, when you see these liver enzymes, right? When you see these in your clinic, you're like, this is no good, right? We have a physician's assistant here who's in the trenches. You start to see these things get over 100. It's not just a little smoke. You have a wildfire going on in the liver, okay? And it's not just in the liver because we also see the, actually, we don't even have the GGT, right? One second. But you see the ALT, or sorry, AST is a little bit more specific to the heart. So something is going on in the heart from, from abusing these compounds. And I've worked with a lot of men who have just like, you know what? I want to get a little bit more jack, so I'm going to take some SARMs. Because they're not, they're not steroids, they're just SARMs. Same stuff happens with their blood work. It's, it's not good. So if you know someone, I mean, and they're committed to this, low dose HRT is gonna be way safer than any of that stuff. I'll just tell you, but yeah, question in the back. You just kind of answered because I was ready to ask, how much is the abuse? How much was he paid? Yeah, so he didn't tell me the exact dosages of the testosterone, but I'm gonna guess between 500 milligrams a week and 1,000 milligrams a week. Um, so definitely abusing HRT doses are going to be up to 150, 200 milligrams per week. Now, some people are like, oh, I'm on HRT and they're doing 300 a week. That's a full on steroid cycle. But still, that's when you start to see, by the way, this stuff happens. It's reliable. Like literally, if you give someone testosterone and you're a betting person, you would say, I bet their hematocrit, hemoglobin, liver enzymes are gonna increase. It reliably happens. And I'm not anti-testosterone. I'm not on testosterone, but if people want to do that, I'm fine with that. So long as they do track their hemoglobin hematocrit to make sure their blood doesn't get thick and hypercoagulable. This is, I think, why we saw so many bodybuilders die during the pandemic, during COVID, because COVID, SARS-CoV-2 happens to increase clotting cascades in the body. Okay. Now there's another thing that also increases clotting cascades in the body, but the virus itself actually increases clotting cascades. And so if your blood is already thick and viscous and you get COVID, you're, at, you're increasing the odds that that may happen. Okay. So important stuff here. So in this person, I said, look, you got to back off on whatever you're doing. And I would go and donate blood like today, if you can, like seriously, because the thickness of the blood. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
Yeah. The theory back then was that it was just creating more water. Is that still a thing today, or is it has, has it changed? Yeah, it has changed. There's been a lot of randomized clinical trials in actual humans showing its effectiveness. But when creatine was first, it was a creatine monohydrate product in the late 90s, mid to late 90s. This was when bodybuilding.com was taken off, right? When, remember AOL Instant Messenger? You got mail. You're like, yes. Right? So that was during that time. I used to order this stuff on the internet, but it also had a ton of dextrose and maltodextrin in it. That was part of the problem. And so it was literally four parts dextrose to one part creatine. So let's say you were doing 10 grams loading, you're getting 40 grams of simple sugar. So if you're already drinking Gatorade or whatever the hell else was popular at the time and that, like that's not a good recipe. So I think that's why there was side effects from that. And it wasn't directly related to the actual creatine, it was more the delivery system. Yeah, you felt puffy in that. Yeah, so now it, there is no need to load it and no need to pair it with a bunch of carbohydrates. So it's sort of, you know, the, the science has evolved and, and all that sort of stuff. And it actually really does benefit women because women don't store as much creatine as men. And, but you do use it. Uh, and it's helpful for the brain. We talked about in the back omega-3s and, and aggression. There's really good research showing creatine actually helps uh, improve cognitive function.